All right, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Jay Krebs. Uh, I'm going to be talking about LinkedIn and some of the data infrastructure and data products and kind of how they built them together. Um, so my background is I, I've been at LinkedIn for a while now. I've been working in this space for a while. Um, I'm on the SNA team at LinkedIn, which has done um, all the data infrastructure, um, any kind of like recommendation systems, search, social graph related uh, products or infrastructure. Um, so I've, I've worked in this space on either infrastructure pieces or using the infrastructure to build something interesting uh, for a while. Um, and so I've, I've also worked on a couple of the open source projects we've done. Uh, Baltimore, which is like a key value storage system. Um, Askeline, which is like a Hadoop uh, workflow scheduler. Uh, and Kafka, which is the, the newest of the three, which is a, a, a publish and subscribe kind of stream, stream processing system. I'm going to talk a little bit about how these things are used um, throughout the so, so what I wanted to what I wanted to focus on for this, typically when I've done talks, I've, I've done a talk on a single system, kind of like how does it how does it handle requests? What's the read path? What's the write path? Um, that's obviously very very interesting if you're interested in that system. But I wanted to give kind of a higher level overview um, of how how these things come together to form like a large application we really did. Um, what are some of the problems we have running them? Um, what, why is it necessary? Uh, these kinds of things, and, and I think that you know that bigger picture stuff is actually probably more important um, and harder to recover from when you get it wrong. So, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I, I think it's a really exciting time right now uh, for for infrastructure in general. I mean, we're basically pulling apart all the things we had and rewriting them. Uh, it, you know, sometimes it's it's a bit immature, um, and and we haven't quite got the patterns and paradigms down. Um, so I'll give you my thoughts on kind of like where we're at now and. and as much as I know of how that's going to work out. Um, so, so I asked this question um, on Quora, um, I don't know, a while back, four months ago or something. Um, and uh, it was you know, a typical Quora experience. I don't know if you've used it, it's a question site. But, and so you get all these luminaries, and they come and they give you these really long answers about why. Why is big data suddenly so important? And it was all about, you know, New machine learning algorithms with the rise, you know, stochastic gradient descent uh, has come back into force, and it's much easier to train these large classifiers. Blah blah blah. Uh, and and then down at the bottom, there's one answer which was hidden as uh, irrelevant, which was, um, you know, answering the question why the current obsession with big data and it was uh, because of the internet, and that was it. It wasn't even in a sense. Um, and I think that was the best answer because um, that's what we're seeing, right? We're seeing this incredible concentration of data. I think if you went back in time to to um, when the web was getting started, you could easily have predicted all of this happening, right? I mean, you could pretty much predict to where we were and say, look, uh, all this data is going to be concentrated in individual sites. Uh, you could say there's going to be all kinds of privacy implications. Uh, but if you were an infrastructure nerd, you could say there's going to be all kinds of infrastructure implications because we do not know how to build that, uh, that kind of system, right? And so and I think that's what's driven the more innovative data products, and it's what's driven um, the more innovative uh, changes in data infrastructure as well. Um, so it's, it's kind of obvious, but, but, but that's why I think this is all happening. And I think that what we're trying to do here is, is basically, if you simplify it, you get past all the like SQL, no SQL, is SQL good? Uh, basically what we're trying to do for modern data infrastructure is make lots of little computers look like one big one, uh, which doesn't quite work, right? And so we're trying to work around the limitations of that network. And that's the fundamental thing. I think query language is, is very important. That's not the fundamental thing. That's not why all the change is happening. Right, I think this is the fundamental thing. So, so the other thing that's going on is we're moving from a very simple architecture, right? Where you have a web server that talks to a database. And um, I think a lot of people think this is bad. I think this is great, right? If you, if you can have a very simple architecture with all your data in one place, in one machine, that's fantastic. And a lot of kinds of software this still works great for, right? But large internet systems doesn't work that great for. And so you start to move to something which is much more complicated, right? This is kind of a stylized picture of LinkedIn. It's very stylized, so I, you know, uh, it's throwing away 90% of everything. But what you're seeing is these are th this is you know the web tier. These are you know storage systems of some kind, right? So these are distributed systems in their own right. They have some kind of consistency semantics. They have to deal with failures uh, among machines, and each one of these is handling these problems in different ways, right? So you have a social graph service which is doing graph related queries. You have a recommendation system, which is suggesting different kinds of content to people. Uh, you have primary and secondary kinds of storage systems um, that, are, that are basically you know, storing the actual data that you would look up, right? Uh, you have newsfeed, which is a very kind of complicated 
uh, system in any environment, which is, you know, what's, what's the stream of things we should be looking at? And you have search systems. Um, then down here, uh, you have Hadoop, which is this, this batch offline system, right, where you're doing offline processing, reporting, any kind of production batch programming. Um, and somehow, each of these systems is much better than the database at the thing it does, but they're specialized. And all of the data has to be now replicated between all of them, has to be kept in sync. Right? How do you know it's all in sync? Um, and so all of these new problems come from, from having this kind of specialization, even though each one of these systems is, is much better. Um, so, so a lot of the challenges come out of that. I think the other thing that's important to think about is which of these things should you have? Right? Do you need to have a specialized graph thingy? Um, maybe you can get rid of that and just use a good storage system to do that. Do you need to have a specialized recommendation infrastructure if you want to do recommendations, right? I mean, most modern websites, they have something like similar items, you know, look at this, newsfeed is very similar to that kind of recommendation stuff. So, so do you need special infrastructure for that, or can you just build it out of the pieces you've got, right? Um, I think these are the questions that, that people have to think through, and when you do it wrong, uh, you're, you're typically stuck with it, right? So, so the phrase I've heard for this is uh, polygon persistence, meaning, we're just going to have lots of these systems, and we'll store this one in Redis, and this one in HBase, and this one in that. And I think that's, that's kind of true, right? There's definitely multiple systems, but I think that's probably the wrong way to think about it and design something if you're, you're trying to build this, right? I think um, the reason for that um, is because each one of these systems is a huge headache. <laughs> Every single one of them is a massive headache. Um, for, to, to, you know, to make a, a system run well, you're going to end up with more tooling and monitoring than you will core logic code that's in you know, the request path, right? Um, you're going to end up having, for, for almost any of these systems, dedicated engineers in addition to operations people, right? So it's not just DBAs anymore. You have, you have people who basically know the code. And this is true whether or not you write something internally or you download it, right? So for, for Hadoop, which is one of the more mature things in this space, we have a number of people who basically work on Hadoop, right? Um, why? Why don't we just get what we got? Well, it turns out there's, there's work to do. Um, and so, in addition to that, uh, none of this is well documented. You have to train up everybody uh, who needs to work with all these different systems so they can use it effectively. Um, and the final observation, which is not obvious, is that all of these systems have much more robust architectures. Um, but that's not really the first thing that keeps a system up. The first thing that keeps the system up is, is just practical operations, I think. So first three nines of availability are just practical operations. What are your operational practices? How do you monitor stuff? Do you know how to deal with like common failures? How quickly can you do that? That kind of stuff. All the rest of it becomes operational, right? And you could argue about how many nines, but basically that, that first chunk is really how good are you at it. People who are good at running Oracle can keep it up pretty well, um, even though there's no, you know, uh, partition, replicated, distributed, fault tolerant, failure detection, none of that, right? So, so the conclusion here is it's a very immature space. Um, each of these different sub-areas is, is much better at what it does than what it replaced, right? Um, but you still have to pick, right? And so, so how, do you, how do you make these kind of choices? I think um, there's, there's really two things driving infrastructure products. And rather than go through kind of a laundry list of different products out there and say, oh, you know, pluses of this versus that, which I'm, I'm probably not the best person to say anyway. Um, I think a better way to understand it is go a little bit deeper and look at the applications that are driving people to build this stuff, and then the constraints that are going to be on, on top of any piece of infrastructure, right? So applications, I mean, you know, features on websites, whatever the thing you're trying to accomplish is. Uh, and I think these projects are usually, they're usually more or less defined by the trade-offs they're making uh, between these constraints. And the trade-offs are usually going to be designed by the um, application that you're trying to support. So, so that's how I think is, it's useful to think about it. Um, the constraints are actually relatively straightforward. You can pick them up easily, right? There's, there's hardware constraints, and I think these are pretty well known. You know, there's, you know, there's a jet gain numbers everyone should know. That's really uh, latency numbers everyone should know. There's a bunch of other numbers you should know, too. If you haven't seen that, check it out. There's a, there's a really famous and now relatively old PowerPoint uh, from David Patterson called Latency Lags Bandwidth. Um, if you want to see why there's so many of these systems, I, and we're going to look at just one thing, I think you would look at that PowerPoint. And so that PowerPoint is about the trade-off between, really throughput is what we would usually call it, and latency. And so you'll see some systems are, are designed around latency. They want to get your request time as low as possible. 
And some are designed around throughput, right? Hadoop is designed around throughput. They want to get as many bytes through as possible. And so when you're, when you're looking at these things, those are the important things to, to think about. Obviously, there's the cost of all the parts that get you this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, one of the interesting things to think about is this stuff is not uh, the laws of physics. It's not set in stone, right? So things can change. For example, SSDs are becoming much, much more competitive with, uh, you know, spinning rust type disks. And, and if that happens, um, and it becomes very practical to run off of them, the major constraint of a lot of data systems, which we see, kind of goes away. You get a bunch of new constraints about how many times you can write data before it stops working. But, um, mm -hmm. but that's really different. Now, everybody who's been working for all this time on, on one set of constraints, now it's all wrong. Oh, well, that's exciting. <laughs> Um, okay, then there's a bunch of other constraints around, you know, path dependency. You kind of end up incrementally building on systems and so on. Okay, so that's constraints. I want to talk about applications. Like, what are the things that people are trying to build which are putting pressure beyond just adding a caching layer in front of your database? Yeah. So I think, I think that was what people were doing for a while, right? They had, you know, some MySQL and some memcache in front of it. Um, and that worked pretty well. It was pretty simple to understand. There's some issues. Uh, maybe it's a little more complicated than it used to be, but it basically worked. Um, and so, and I think what's really driven people beyond that is, is data intensive applications. So I want to go through a couple of examples of this. Um, we spent a lot of time on it and how these things put different kinds of pressure on systems. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit after that about what types of systems solve those problems and how we've solved some of these problems. Um, so the, the, I'm calling them non-CRUD applications because they're doing more than just putting a row in a database, and then getting the row back out to show to people. That problem is usually not that hard to solve. I mean, at large scale, it's hard. It's not that hard. Uh, usually, people want to get the row out more than they want to put the row in. Uh, so you can cache your way out of it. Uh, and so I think that's not that hard. What, what you tend to see uh, trouble arising around is these kinds of problems. So, so problems around recommendations are very data intensive. They're going to use what are people actually looking at, what are they interested in. They're going to use um, other kinds of color cards between things. They're going to use data about users. And they're going to want to look at a lot of data. Um, a lot of the graph stuff, social graph is part of it, but anything related to following. It turns out a lot of things that are happening on a website are very, very closely graph related, other than social graphs. Right? That, that tends to create a lot of pressure on data systems. Why? Because when you move in a graph, where you go next always depends on where you just landed. So it's very hard to that. Right? Um, search. Search is kind of the core NoSQL system, so now nobody thinks about it, but, but uh, no one wants to do their search in the database anymore for whatever reason, um, and so you end up with specialized distributed systems built around it. Data normalization is something that's not very much talked about. Um, I'm going to talk more about what that is, uh, but, but, but basically it's when you take data off the internet from your users, whatever, and you try to make this pristine model of something that works. So Netflix does this, right? Um, you go to Netflix, you can click on a director, you can click on an actor, it will show you that director, it will show you other movies they directed. They understand directors, they understand which movies they are. They understand if a show has multiple seasons, the seasons have, they've totally modeled that space. I don't know how they did it, they might have just hired somebody to type it all in, which is a totally good approach. Right? But for large data sets, this kind of normalization becomes very difficult. And I'll talk about some of those applications. And Newsfeed is classic, right? Newsfeed is what to show you on your homepage of interesting updates. Uh, and finally, analysis and monitoring. Analysis is reporting, right? It's how is the business doing? Monitoring is how are our servers doing? Weirdly, typically solved by totally different systems. But very similar, very similar in nature. One just usually happens a little faster. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through some of these applications. Uh, at LinkedIn, you know, I'll talk a little bit about kind of some of the challenges, right? So this is a social graph. I'm just taking snippets of UI to show you, right? Here we're showing paths between people. This is between me and Kevin Bacon. Um, these are the different paths that I can go through. This is slightly different. This is people I know ranked by some kind of closeness at O'Reilly, right? So one of the key things to look at here is the graph data is not just about the edges and the nodes. It's also about the other attributes which are associated uh, with those edges and nodes, companies, right? Skills that people might have. Um, and so that's where a lot of the data comes from. Uh, and that's what makes it interesting. Just a, a raw graph is not that interesting. Search. Um, so search is one of the things LinkedIn wants to be good at. Um, and so there's, there's a bunch of parts to that. 
Um, one of the most important parts is actually what the data you have to index is. How good is it? What attributes do you have for relevance? What attributes do you have to be able to drill down further? That's going to come back to the normalization of the chapter. Uh, recommendations, this, this could go into multiple slides. Uh, but this is one of the core things I think you see on modern websites, right? The change in behavior is people don't really want um, to, to use software that, the way they used to. You used to kind of put data into the software and then you issued commands and it did the commands. Now they pretty much want something good to show up on the page. That's a much bigger requirement. <laughs> it's much bigger, right? And, so, so, and the requirements to, to fulfill that are much harder. Um, so these are two applications here. This is recommending people I know at, uh, but have not connected to with the Apache Software Foundation. Um, and you can kind of filter down by different attributes of those people. Uh, and this is recommending uh, people similar to me. The number one person is my boss, so I, I guess that's pretty good. Uh, Ditto with recommending jobs. That's, those are recommendations centered around people, recommendations centered around jobs. Uh, this is something else LinkedIn wants to be good at, right? Basically, take the set of jobs, understand their attributes, what skills they want, what kind of experience they want, how desirable is the company, what's the transition probability between your company and that company, uh, and then understand you, like what are your skills, how much experience and how good are you with them, and be able to do that matching. It's exactly the same as, uh, I think yesterday someone was talking about dating sites, right? Okay, but all of these are dating problems, right? So different kinds of data. And, and for each of these, you have a couple, right? One is recommending jobs to people. One is recommending people to jobs. If you post a job, here's some candidates. Uh, and the other is similar jobs. Uh, and there's lots of variations on this. Here, this is some matchup of social graph information with uh, recommendations. So newsfeed, this is one that's been talked about a lot. It's, you know, what are the interesting things happening in this space for you? Uh, and finally, data normalization. This is a, a page about the skill to do. And so we, we've done this process, which is actually very hard for, for a lot of kinds of content. So we've done it for uh, skills like Hadoop. We've done it for companies. Um, we've done it for actually a bunch of different types of data. It goes through different phases. Um, it's part machine learning, um, and it's part some feedback loop that improves it. And the goal is to get some content that you can show to people that actually captures your understanding of this, right? So for the skill Hadoop, we basically matched up to Wikipedia pages. We've ranked top people for Hadoop. Now we've done this without any actual feedback yet, so is it good? It's okay, right? This is pure machine learning. It needs some, I think it needs some feedback. We haven't added that yet. You can see Tom White, that's pretty good. Everyone, that's pretty good. Doug Cutting, that's pretty good. But you know, where's, where's Owen? I don't know, right? But so you can, these things progress. You start with something which is purely machine learning and you just get some kind of user feedback and so on. Once you have that, then you can do related companies to the scale. This page goes on. But this is, this is about kind of understanding that space. Once you have that understanding, you can make it into a search system, you can make it into a central graph, you can use it for recommendations. So these are the kinds of like core data problems, I think, that put the greatest pressure on, um, on data systems. And the final one is reporting, uh, analytics. This is a picture of user-facing reporting we do. We show you, oh, people who viewed your profile. We also show you uh, people who viewed your ad if you are doing ad campaigns, and we show you people who viewed your company page if you have a company page. One of the interesting things about this, a lot of sites are doing stuff like this, is um, it turns every read into a write. Every read in one system turns into a write in this other system, which is really terrible if you think about it. Um, or good, I mean, you can uh, so, so the way we break this down um, is into a couple of different systems. Uh, again, there's always this trial to have as, as few as possible, but it takes time to get from one to the other. Um, so search, uh, we, we basically use a distributed search system. It's built on top of Lucene, but the distribution layer, everything it does, the real-time indexing, fast chaining, that was done by us. Um, and that's open source, you can download it. Um, and so we use the search system to do a significant portion of the recommendations. Recommendations, it turns out for us, are kind of a hybrid thing from an infrastructure perspective, where we use a bunch of different pieces of infrastructure depending on the trailers. A social graph, we have a custom system, right? The memory, the data is all in memory. Um, like the search system, you're doing some kind of scatter gather out to nodes, but different, slightly different request pattern. Storage, we have Oracle, which we're still trying to get rid of. <laughs> uh, not as easy as it sounds. Uh, we have Voldemort, which is very kind of simple scalable dumb storage. It's like key value storage. Uh, we have a new thing called Espresso, which is really kind of our attempt at replacing Oracle, that's kind of in the making. Um, so that one's not open source yet, but I think 
as we start to get it really running, um, maybe it will be. It offers kind of timeline consistency, much richer queries. Um, it's kind of a compromise between the formulation of the system and um, you know key value storage or something very different. Um, and then you have streams. This I'm going to talk about a little bit more. This is what glues everything <laughs> together. Um, this is how data gets between all these systems. Uh, this is how the activity data about what people are doing gets captured. Uh, uh, and then at the very back, you have this offline system, which does big crunching. And that for us is to do. Right? So we, we've, we started out with kind of a centralized data warehouse, and we've kind of been slowly moving uh, everything to Hadoop. It started with all the um, batch programming, which is things that will eventually go out to users. Uh, a lot of recommendations are done there as well. Recommendations you can build out of hybrid stuff. Right? So, so another way to break this down is kind of by paradigm. There's, there's really three paradigms here, right? Request response, uh, streams, and batch. So I gave some examples. Re request response are these latency-oriented things. Users are waiting, somebody's waiting. Your goal is to have something which is, you know, five milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, something like that. Uh, streams uh, are, are kind of in between. It's as fast as you can. And batch is hourly or daily, right? And they have different metaphors for how data is viewed. They have a different way of doing partitioning, um, and, and they, have, they have a pretty significant set of trade-offs. I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. One of the things, though, is this is how the infrastructure breaks down. The features themselves can make use of multiple of these things. So, so this is back to uh, recommending people, and this is actually completely multi-paradigm. These, the results are basically being uh, calculated in Hadoop, right? So, for most of these recommendations, we can do we can do the matching offline or online. And offline uh, has a lot of nice properties I'll talk about. So that would be our preference. But, but for many things, you can't do it offline because you don't know what you need to match until right away. So in that case, you can do it online. And so we have a way to move these algorithms kind of back and forth. Um, and so this is basically you know, a Hadoop job that calculates these scores between um, the 100 million members. Right? So we, we take uh, tens of billions of possible relationships, score and rank them. Uh, and we, we keep for each user, you know, hundreds, but not all of them, of the most probable relationships. All this faceting stuff is actually just done by the search system. So we, we throw this list of IDs, and it's able to come up with a relevant attribute. So for me, I thought the relevant attributes of company would be people at LinkedIn, people at past companies, I work for, Yahoo, Apache, whatever. Um, and then, this stuff, which you can't really see in this picture, but this is kind of your distance to it, that's done by social graph. Right? So you say, oh, give me, the, give me social graph distance, please. If you, if you X them out, um, or even if you just see them, that activity data is fed back into the system. Right? So that activity data is being processed as a stream and fed back into the system to say, hey, this person doesn't like that recommendation, or this person um, you know, saw this. So we'd say, look, you saw it 10 times. You don't want to so the request response stuff tends to be the hardest to build and run, I think. Um, there you're basically looking at uh, when a node fails, you have to recover, um, detect that and recover really in a very short period of time. Every, that, that whole time when you're figuring out that the node is down is probably going to be added to at least you know, some requests uh, who are sitting there waiting or whatever's happening. So, so this, this is typically the most uh, stressful to run when it's down, the website's down. So, um, and, and it tends to get the most number of requests, I mean, for obvious reasons, right? So, so it tends to want to keep a, a fairly large amount of data in memory, right? Again, limiting latency, right? Getting rid of disk seeks. Uh, could change as we change hardware, but, but that's how it is. Um, so, so the way these all work more or less the same. You, you have either a broker or a smart client who knows who to talk to. And that's going to you know, fan out requests. And they each have a different pattern. So a search system is probably going to fan out the requests to everybody because you have to search all the results. Now, there's different um, replicas. So it's not hitting every server, but it's hitting every partition. Right? A storage system is probably just going to go to the right partition. Uh, so in that respect, storage system is, is much cheaper request to process. Uh, and it scales better with the total data size. And you, there's more you can say about partitioning strategies for these. I think we've written it up for most of the things we've done, so I, I wasn't going to go into details on that. You can read about it. 
people have seen lots of these different hashing, range partitioning, whatever, and, and different things make sense uh, for different systems. Um, batch is one of the more interesting ones. I've, I've heard a couple talks uh, where people were kind of down on it. They're saying, well, it's very kind of hokey, it's slow, it's going to go away, you know, in the future, uh, we won't have any batch processing. I think it's totally wrong. Um, so so I, I agree it's slow, and I agree that trying to make things run uh, with low latency in a batch environment, you know, every five minutes or something is very painful. Uh, you probably shouldn't do it. Um, but, but I think it's going to be around for a while, right? So, so a couple of reasons. First of all, um, the, the limits on data size have been, have been largely removed here uh, with the data, which is, which is hugely exciting. Now you can take all the data the organization has, and you can put it in one place. Um, and you can do whatever you want with it without thinking really about how it's organized. There's no, there's no indexes, there's no query plans, and there's a full table scan. So, so, so that makes you extremely agile in what you can do with data. And so I think most data ideas start here. Most don't start with a real-time system. Some do. But, but it's actually an anti-pattern. If we see something starting real-time, we try to think very hard about a way that we can do it uh, not real time first, even if it's just a prototype, because you can iterate so much faster. All your data is in one place. Right? If you want to call multiple different systems and glue things together, that can be relatively complicated. In code, right? If you're gluing together different data sources and data description, now a couple things have to be true. Right? One of those is um, you need to have different tools for different uses. Right? So, so Java MapReduce is the kind of this is important, we run it every day, it must be efficient, we're going to tune the hell out of it. Um, a lot of stuff is just gluing data together, and there we mostly use tape. Uh, and then taking all these parts and turning a bunch of different processing steps. Some of these, some of these workflows that do like skills, or people uh, you may know, or whatever, they have like 40 or 50 different sub-steps in them that just do different kinds of data processing. Things, right? um, so gluing that all together into one holistic thing and handling failures and restarting from the failure, that's all the workflow thing. So you need to do workflow. You need to support the higher level tools. Uh, and you need to have uniform data throughout everything. So we're using Avro now for all of our data infrastructure. We haven't gotten everything moved to it, but that's what we're doing. Um, there's nothing magical about it. It's, uh, it's um, the best designed of the different serialization libraries and the most buggy. So, so we were hoping that moving the bugs were worth them all out and just we'll be stuck with the best design. If that doesn't happen, then uh, they would really be sad. Um, and you have to think about how data gets in and out of this system, right? And, and I think one of the biggest things we've found from working with the batch system is you need to plan to get all the data in, which means there can be uh, almost no incremental cost of adding a data source, right? So, so I mean, I don't know, for different companies it's different sizes, but usually, um, the, the number, the amount of data types you have is probably related to how many people, engineers you have making new data types. Um, and so if you have fewer data types, you have, probably have fewer people to get them all into Hadoop. So you need to have like order one uh, time for, for data, right? It can't be order n where n is the number of tables. You can't set up a process to copy in a table. It has to be like copy in all the tables and that job runs and it copies in all the tables. Uh, this is maybe kind of an esoteric point, but if you don't do that, then you don't have the data there ready to use. And if you don't have that, then people don't use it because it's a huge pain to go and set up stuff and get the data, blah, blah, blah. And, and so I, I think that's probably the, one of the most key learnings. Um, anyhow, so coming back to why I think this won't go away, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things. The biggest one is safety, right? So you, you just can't break the website from Hadoop. I mean, you can, but it's very hard. Um, even when the Hadoop cluster comes down for config changes and upgrades and stuff, that's fine. It's not a big deal. The job will all restart, right? And when you have safety, you can be very audacious in the kinds of difficulty of things you try. Right? If you're, if you're in request response land, you can't. Right? Because everything you try is adding milliseconds, right? Anything that can go wrong is going to be a very big concern. Worst case for the batch then is, you know, it has a bug, it stops, you have to restart it from the point of failure, data is delayed a little bit. So I, I think we're going to keep doing this. It's also very easy. It maps very closely to how people think. They say, oh, I want to take this data. I want to find the top these. I want to glue it onto this. It maps very closely to that, right? Um, and the third one is the throughput compared to a request response system is very, very good. Right? This kind of system can have very, very high throughput. It reads data in large lumps. This comes back to that um, bandwidth latency 
uh, trade-off. Right? So, so what you find is for networks, for memory, for disks especially, really especially disks, um, if you can read large glumps of data at a time, you can, you can get very good throughput. You typically can't get very good latency for a per user request. Why? user doesn't want that much data. They just want a few bytes, so you have to batch it up. Right? Um, the final reason is economics, right? If you have a, a large pool of people making these jobs, you can have a big pool of hardware and just throw all the jobs on and let them, let them work it out. Uh, scaling a bunch of individual systems is actually very hard to get right. It's hard to get high utilization. Right? You typically can't uh, have a request response system that uh, is going to have uh, very high utilization because you don't know what spikes you're going to see and you, you don't want to go down when that happens. Worst case here is things get a little slow. So, so I think we're I think we're going to be doing this for a while, and I think Hadoop is probably the most uh, sure thing in this space. Um, so then that brings up a good question, which is if, if you have to do request response because people want to come to your website and get the website right away, uh, you have to do request response, and you're going to do batch because that's good. Why why have anything in the middle? Why do why do streaming? Uh, so I, I think the reason for this is. Um, the first reason is, well, now you have all these systems, you have to stitch them together. So you have to have these data streams that will feed everybody uh, their data. Um, and I think this is one of the, the least developed areas of the kind of NoSQL data system space. Right? So we, we open source something recently in this space. Um, we're trying to make it better. It's a new project. We just, we just uh, kind of added to the uh, Apache incubator. Uh, it's called Kafka. Um, and so that's, that's where we're going with it. Um, I, I don't know what it will looks like in, in the end, but I think it's really important. Um, the other thing is here, I, I talked about batching up data to get high throughput, right? That's how Hadoop wins, right? And one of the things you notice is you don't have to batch up that much data. Hadoop, you're usually batching up, you know, these terabytes of data, you're just doing these things. But you don't need a terabyte to get data throughput. You actually just need to batch things a little bit, right? So, uh, kilobytes, really. Um, and so if you can just delay processing a little bit, instead of doing one request at a time, let a few come together and process it out of stream. I don't know if that makes sense. You can get much better throughput. Right? So, so this actually gives you a knob. You can say, oh, I want more latency and better throughput. Or, uh, no, I just want that message to go through as quickly as possible. The other issue is if you actually need to get results out of this faster. So for a lot of our data normalization, somebody comes in, they update their profile. We need to actually tag them relatively quickly with the right skills, whatever. It's going to be weird on the website if they don't get tagged quickly, if their company doesn't show up right. So we can't just wait until a Hadoop job runs next day and have it show up, right? Um, if you need to do that, it's much easier to build with a streaming system that processes this kind of infinite stream of incoming uh, items rather than a batch system where you're trying to turn files and jobs into something similar to a key. Um, so, so that's kind of how I see this space. Uh, those are That's a little bit about our entries. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit more about um, what makes these systems work or, or not work, um, you know, for us, what I found. Um, and and uh, the biggest thing I would emphasize is, is operations and operability. Um, and this is the biggest weakness people have uh, when they come here. They mostly think of it in terms of engineering, and they mostly don't think about it in terms of what it takes to run it. And I think most, the reason for that is because most people looking into this stuff are engineers, so they're not DBAs. DBAs think in a totally different way. Um, so that's, that's all about monitoring. The other, the other part here is simplicity. Like, you want to have the fewest pieces you can have. It's more likely to work if it has fewer pieces. It's almost always true. Um, and then finally, a lot of just basic things like documentation. People understand how to use it right. It takes a long time to learn how to use uh, MySQL or Oracle right. right. These systems are a little similar, uh, hopefully. But um, if there's more of them, then people are going to learn it. Um, and the, the, the other most helpful things uh, is lazy users. One of the problems you have in good companies is you have the opposite of lazy users. Right? Users, in this case, I mean, are, are uh, engineers at your company, right? Um, if, if you, smart people love to learn hard things. They wish we would move all the code to like Haskell or something. That would make it so much harder uh, to program, right? That would be so exciting. It would be very challenging. You would relearn everything from scratch. Um, those people do not help you build good systems because they are willing to adapt to whatever complexity you introduce in their lives. Lazy people are the best, right? The people I loved were the ones who were like, screw it, I'm not learning pig, I want SQL. 
right? So okay, we do Hive, and it turns out, yeah, that is actually a much lower barrier for a lot of people, and that's a good, that's a good solution. I think these people, think they, they push you to do the right thing. Uh, now, you don't want to have a bunch of lazy developers for other reasons, <laughs> but it's really good for the infrastructure. Um, and the final thing is open source. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about this area is it's being developed in the open. Like, we, we don't really know how to do it, right? Nobody knows how to build these systems. I think that's one thing you'll hear in all the talks. Um, but it's being done very much in the open, and not a lot of things have happened that way. When you think about how operating systems were developed, um, how you know, relational databases were developed, uh, there was definitely a part done in academia, which was fairly open. Um, but none of it was like this open. Um, and so I think that's very exciting. I think there's some challenges to it, but it's, it's very interesting. Um, so, so I think it works out really well uh, if you're working in this space, even if, um, regardless of what happens to the open source project, we have like nine of these projects. Some of them are used by like three people outside of LinkedIn. Um, and the reason that's still good is because the people who work on the project start to think of it like a product, um, instead of like this thing that has to be done to solve such and such at LinkedIn. And when you start to think about that, you kind of round out the offering, it, you know, what is this thing about? What should it be good at? What should it not be good at? Um, I think that dramatically improves software. I think the same with documentation, all these things. If you want to get um, engineers to write documentation, the best way is uh, let them open source and stop them. I, I think it also just motivates people um, to want to do a good job. Uh, because people like, you know, in addition to money, which everybody likes, um, it's really nice to have other people see what you've done. Um, and infrastructure doesn't really get seen otherwise. So, and it works for companies in, in the web space because really the proprietary thing for them is the data, right? They don't want massive data loss kind of things happening. The infrastructure is like really important, but that's not the big thing, right? If, if, if with our data, you could replicate our site, but with our infrastructure, probably. So, so anyhow, these are, these are the different projects uh, we've done, and then the things that we're kind of using, uh, I guess, heavily. It, it's roughly 50-50 split. We found you need slightly more engineers if you're going to do it internally, but not that many more <laughs> because of the state of maturity of these things, right? Um, some of them are, are pretty mature, but in general, you end up having a fair amount of people dedicated to the project no matter what. Um, and, and that's about it. That's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, if people have questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. You can you can get the software at that last link. Um, so I don't know any any questions, anything at all. Back there. Is it going to plan to move stuff to the cloud? Uh, uh, probably not. I mean, so personally, for me, I feel like I'll probably never work at another uh, company that doesn't rent its its infrastructure. Um, but I don't think that at larger scale it's actually going to be cheaper. I, I think it's, it's a question of, it's, it's almost certainly more expensive now. The question is, you know, should you be spending time and energy, and if you're waiting for a new data center to come up, is that a good idea? Right, so an example is to do, right? If you look at what you pay per machine um, and what you get by, by running it on Amazon, I don't think it's a very good deal. Um, now, it's a great deal if you don't want to have to go out and find a new data center space, negotiate with vendors, wait for them to ship the hardware. And then like one thing that we found was we found that uh, there was a bug in the hardware, uh, which meant that the drive bay things rubbed on the power supply cord until the uh, coding of it came off, uh, which could electrocute people. Now that is not the level of abstraction you want to be working at, right? So it's a trade off. On one hand, um, I, think you can, I think you can get much better efficiency out of stuff. Uh, if you if you do it internally. On the other hand, now all of a sudden you're like, oh man, so we have to go in and put little rubber bands. I mean, I didn't have to do it, but <laughs> the systems people did. We have to go and put in, we were delayed on what we were trying to do because of it. little rubber bands on all these things to keep the wires from rubbing. I mean, come on, that's, that is not the level of abstraction you want your business to work at. So I, I think it's a big trade-off. I think once you're already big, you're probably not going to do it. I, I think Netflix has done it. It's been very hard for them. Um, I think they have unique challenges in some areas and just like, I, I don't know, I, you could argue either way, but I think it's much, much more compelling for a small company where that kind of distraction would just totally derail the business. For a large company, you have a group that does it, it's probably okay, but there's still good trade-offs. Any other questions? Okay. Jay,
In, in which system? Yeah, I guess most of them rely on compression of some sort, right? So in search, inverted indexes have their own compression stuff. Graph stuff, we've done a custom implementation of a paper that does um, kind of like graph list compression. Um, the storage systems in Hadoop, I think we're using Hyperlazy or, or GZIP, depending on whether it's intermediate or, or normal data. Um, it all works pretty well. I mean, it's a, it's a huge trade-off. Uh, but, but it's a huge win, I mean, in terms of data size and whatever else, so it's almost always worth it. Um, the other thing is, I think just making the data small to begin with helps a lot, right? Not storing text formats is, is really important. I think uh, don't put all your data in XML or JSON or whatever. Uh, I think using protocol buffers or Abra or something, you get, some, you know, the, the compression reduces the gap between the text formats and the binary formats. But if you start small, you get smaller, right? So, so I think that that's fairly important as well. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, our, so our Hadoop setup, we actually have three clusters. We actually have four clusters. Um, we have, uh, the, the main ones are a production cluster which runs things which will affect users at some point. They're producing data for the website, right? Um, and then the, there's a development, reporting, analysis cluster, and that one's about twice as big as the uh, production cluster. Um, and the, that's really for everything else. Either you're doing development for things that will affect users, or you're just running reports, or you're just fiddling about, whatever it is. And then th those are the main ones people interact with. And then we have a, a very small cluster that does pre-processing of data. So for example, we take in uh, database diffs, we merge them to create full sets. We do that in a central location and push it out to the other places. Um, and then finally, we have an experimental cluster where we have like uh, you know uh, two or three running, uh, and kind of not working yet, or we have whatever other experiments we're doing. We do uh, certain kinds of performance uh, tuning there because it's very hard to figure out if anything's getting faster or slower on a cluster with a bunch of jobs running on it. Um, so that, that's about it. That, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the the the, the dynam dynamism, I don't know if that's word, the, the dynamic nature of the elasticity, I think that part's fantastic. Like I said, I think this is really the last time that uh, I work with, um, you know, like our own data centers, our own hardware. And I think also the offerings to support this stuff will get better. Um, I think the problem we had, we actually looked at doing a new on Amazon because there's so little uh, latency requirements, it's very feasible. Um, and their hardware offering is just not very good for it. I mean, like, we weren't interested in running anything on S3. The local disks are not nearly large enough. So there's all these trade-offs you get. On the other hand, like, you know, EC2 allocated new cluster is, like, awesome, <laughs> right? So I, we, we did it in-house. It was hugely painful to get the operational expertise in-house, to get, you know, the operations people to understand what really meant, what was really important for Hadoop. It, it took a couple years to do that. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but we thought, well, look, this is really important for our business, and this is the spot we want to go to, so we'll suck it up. Uh, I, I'm hoping that someone will start renting great Hadoop machines. Um, that would be nice. Okay. So what kind of exercises do you do to determine the gray ratio of the CPU to disk? Oh, yeah, so it's, it's really hard. For, for Hadoop, it's, you're kind of eyeballing it because at different times it's going to be different stuff and it depends on the mix of the jobs. Um, it becomes relatively clear. So, so that is one of the things we do with the test cluster. Um, I mean, it, it's basic monitoring, right? We use like ganglia and you basically look at where, what's not being used. Is CPU not being used? Is disk kind of not being used? Or are you running out of uh, disk space? Um, for us, it's mostly going to be I.O. and CPU. We usually hit those before we hit, um, before we hit disk space. Uh, and so, so I think we have uh, around eight drives per machine, um, a fair amount of memory. So I, I, I don't know. It, it's different. You think you kind of eyeball it, and you don't. Since you have to make these decisions far in advance, and by the time um, 
by the time you actually have all the hardware set up, how many people have added new jobs, and it'll be slightly different. So you kind of just do something reasonable, and as the set of jobs gets larger and larger, it kind of matters less. I think it kind of stabilizes. You don't have like the one weird job that skews everything. Any other questions? So how does your reporting and uh Analyst team system. Yeah, so, so we're in kind of a, a, a dual state. So we started out with this big uh, centralized Oracle you know, rack fleet. Um, and we've kind of started to move more and more off of that to Hadoop. Originally, for us, Hadoop was about production batch computing. Right? So you write a job, it runs every day, it needs to be efficient, it needs to not fail. Um, then it was like, well, we got really good at running it, we had all this hardware. Once you have, you know, you've got some machines, you figure, like, why, why do we have this other system which is actually slow and having issues? Um, and so that's what we started to do. So we started introducing Hive, we've had like other tools for it. Um, we still run MicroStrategy uh, against the uh, data warehouse, but that's not how most people make their reports. That's more kind of like this very specialized kind of report. Most people run their reports by pasting SQL into this little tool that makes you a magical report. It's very easy to use. Um, and so, so you can kind of run that against anything. Uh, it's very simple and straightforward. I think that's that's kind of like if you have a technical organization, that's kind of like the main requirement. Is like I'll write a SQL. I want to see a report. Run it every day. Either we'll come and look at it or email it to me or something like that. You can build that against Hive. You can build that against. Right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Since you're testing on a smaller cluster than your production cluster, do you feel like you're getting effective information out of it? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, kind of. You kind of do your best with this stuff, and it's not that dangerous, right? Like Hadoop, the worst case is you kind of fiddle up the, the, the mingling of jobs. Um, so, so it's not that dangerous. We review jobs. Or, you know, the big problems with Hadoop is always going to be too many little files, um, you know, that kind of problem. It's, it's not that, uh, it's not that complicated. So I think, I think we're almost out of time. Uh, so if people have other questions, uh, I'm chatting with you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Please, right? Thanks, everyone.